Good morning. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I don't need this. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> mm, thank you. Hello. <laughs> um. Good morning.
Mm-hmm. Okay. So, sh should we start the turn off? Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Microphone. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for participating uh, in Python today. As well as there are some uh, uh, audience that is coming from Zoom. So welcome you all for the second lecture of uh, computation from Stuttgart University, Germany. And uh, without much ado, as you already know, who Professor Peter is. So we'll uh, cordially invite Professor Peter to start with his. Today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Inoka. Yeah, also many thanks from my side that you are interested in this talk and in the topics I present to you. Thank you very much for being here. Yes, um, in the first talk, for those of you who attended, I see some faces I already know, um, I tried to give you an overview of what we are doing in our institute in Stuttgart. And uh, in the two talks today and also next Thursday, I want to give you some details about different aspects. Uh, today I selected two very different topics. One is about paintings and vibration, very unusual topic. You will see in a moment what this has to do with engineering and with dynamics. And uh, the second one is uh, a topic from production engineering, uh, which is very, very heavy based on simulation. So you will see there are very complicated equations, there are very complicated simulation environments, and what you can do in simulations. Okay, uh, in between the two talks, we will have a short break so that you can recover a little bit, and then after the break, we continue with the second talk. The first one, Motion for Emotion, Vibrational Behavior of Paintings. The title is a little bit strange. Motion, yeah, motion, something is moving, there are vibra vibrations, which are disturbing in this case. Emotion, uh, this is about art, and art has a lot to do with emotion. Uh, when we have an engineering system and we damage something, it's usually not that bad. You can repair it, you can replace it just by a new one, maybe it's expensive, but it can be done. Uh, pieces of art are usually one, kind of, uh, one of its kind. So if you destroy it, they are gone forever. And so there's a lot of emotion behind this, and people really uh, think hard how to protect this. You already saw the working areas of our institute, mechatronics, control, driving safety, biomechanics, uncertainty, particles, multi-body system. There's nothing about transportation of art. And this is also quite typical. As engineers, you are educated in a very wide sense, in a very wide field, and so you are able to do different things. If somebody is approaching you, we have a problem, then it's good uh, to talk to an engineer usually. So, for example, our former German Chancellor, uh, Merkel, uh, who many consider as a very successful Chancellor, he had a doctor in physics, also a good education. Most of our people, our politicians, have a different background. Most of them are lawyers, for example, and so they do not understand problems. People in physics and engineering, they are able to look at complicated problems but that's a little bit my personal point of view, why it's good to have uh, people with our background. Also, if you look at the industrial companies, I showed the slide on Monday, uh, you will ne not find a museum or art companies or so. So therefore, let me start at the very beginning. How is did it start? At the very beginning, there was a phone call. Caroline Heinemann, <coughs> uh, at this time still a doctoral student at an art academy, Christoph Kriegel, her supervisor, and they called uh, Pascal Ziegler, the vice director of our institute. And then um, it became interesting. Do you have a shaker that we could borrow? We know precisely that people from art has no idea what is a shaker about. And yes, we have shakers. We have some shakers uh, where you can excite, for example, the little bones in the inner ear. So nanometer range, micrometer range, very small forces. We have big shakers where you can destroy a house. So which kind of shakers do they need and what do they want to do? Usually, if you get these kind of calls, 
uh, it's either very boring or it's very interesting. So it's always worth to uh, give good attention to these calls. And this one was definitely very interesting. So Pascal, yeah, usually you ask the people to talk a little bit, explain what you want to do, what you are in, and then it turned out that she was working on paintings. So this painting looks quite good for me, I'm not an expert. If you look closer, you can see the paint layer is seriously damaged there. So this is not what you want to have and what you want to accept. Apparently this was not an expensive, uh, very valuable uh, painting, so not too bad. Uh, but if this happens to a valuable painting, you are in deep trouble. And you can analyze this uh, carefully with cameras and all kinds of things. And so all started, so um, for example, we tried to do experiments and try to let the painting vibrate and see what, what is happening here. Tried several damping characteristics. We glued accelerometer sensors to the frame. Uh, we even glued some accelerators to the to the canvas, which is of course not allowed for an expensive painting. And so it started from there, many, many different things. We loaded them to a car, transported a picture, see the, the influence, measured many curves, <coughs> and then it ended with a very nice publication about uh, transport monitoring of paintings. And so we thought, okay, there is a lot behind. <clears throat> this is not just the thing you should do once. Uh, we want to go deeper in this. And today I want to give you some information what we have done, different kinds of things interesting for engineers. So the team at the Institute grew. At the moment, there are four to five persons working on this. And we have very interesting cooperation partners. For example, we are cooperating with the University of Arts in Stuttgart. These are the guys who know precisely what is art about and which kind of pain and which kind of uh, fabric below and so on. Uh, then we work with people from museums. Caroline is in the meanwhile in a big uh, art museum. Uh, Professor von Rieden, she's a specialist on uh, the canvas. Uh, and then also uh, an archaeologist, uh, uh, one people from an art transportation company. There are just two or three companies in the world who are able to transport expensive pieces of art. This is a highly specialized area. The company Hasenkamp is uh, maybe the leading company. And so we're very happy that we have one of the uh, important persons from ha Hasenkamp on our team. And also Polytech. This is the development head of Polytech, a company which makes measurement devices. I will introduce data to you. So the team grew and we are very happy with this. Also, we uh, did several things in the lab. So, for example, when you do investigations with pieces of art, the climate is very important. Temperature and humidity. Of course, in Sri Lanka, you know what humidity and temperature is. In Germany, it's not so much. But uh, you have to keep this very constant. And this is sometimes a big problem. So, for example, there is the belief that a piece of art, a painting, should be stored at 22 degrees Celsius. 22 degrees of Celsius means in Germany, usually, we have to heat up this room to reach 22 degrees. Uh, but uh, there is a museum, for example, in the jungle in Brazil, in Managua, and uh, they have usually over 30 degrees of sedum. This means they have to cool down the museum all the time, and they have to keep the temperature constant. If you are not doing this, maybe you destroy the painting, and you get serious trouble with insurance companies, because they have to pay if something is destroyed. Okay. Uh, so, climate chamber was something we had to build and set up. And then it turned out we need, um, we need to do experiments and they had to be reproducible. So therefore we had to produce our own paintings in a very well-defined manner so that we can do experiments. So if I was doing here uh, the production of uh, a painting with a very highly defined quality of thickness of paint and so on everything in the climate chamber, of course. We need excitations. This is one of the shakers they were, were asking for, measurements. I come to this later. And then, for example, we also let uh, li little probes of the painting vibrate and to see when is the paint layer breaking and what is happening there. All this should just give you an idea what it is about. And certainly many of the things you can see here, this is engineering. This is not art anymore only. This is really engineering. Okay, let me give you a few examples. One was the transport monitoring of a marble 
gravestone. This is a gravestone in uh, more than 2,000 years old, a Roman uh, thing. It was buried in the ground for 1,500 years, recovered. It's now in a museum in the south of Germany. Uh, this a um, famous gravestone uh, should have been transported to a museum north of Germany and the owner wanted to ha see what is happening there. Are they damaging his expensive piece of art or so? And then we had to carefully uh, get the state of this. So for example, with this special kind of cameras, no, sorry, I go back and forth one. <coughs> so here you can see the lighting in the middle. You know, so to precisely de determine the topology and the setup, we made many camera uh, views and so on. Um, we were not allowed to touch the uh, stone itself, <laughs> so it's really something highly protected. But we were able, for example, to attach some sensors uh, to its base. And then the transportation started. Of course, to, for during the transportation, nothing may happen because then somebody has to pay for it. So it was packed, it was loaded to a truck, uh, a special company was responsible for this. And you can see all the little details which cause trouble. For example, you cannot simply roll a card over this kind of stone. It will shake too much, it will excite vibration. This is also not the best way to do it. Uh, but okay, you sometimes, somehow you have to survive and then the transportation happened. Okay, first everything looked good. So the first approach would be if somebody is asking you to transport such a stone. Um, it looks like a solid piece of stone, just give it to me, I'll throw it in the trunk of my car, drive to the next place, somebody should help me to carry it. The weight is 300 kilograms, so it should be a strong person to help. And then everything is set up. Okay, this is not really what they have to do, we have to protect it. And here, for example, after the transportation, they found these little stones you see at the lower bound. Just very little parts, one millimeter or so. Obviously, they were broken away from the uh, stone and then uh, they searched carefully where is it, is it critical, is it at a bad position or not a bad position. So uh, these are is the kind of detail they are looking for. Of course, if you transport this piece and it arrives in two pieces, uh, then obviously something is very wrong. Are these stones critical or not critical? They agreed that it's not really so critical. But we did measurements all the time during all this transportation and then for example you find peaks like this here, suddenly there are high accelerations, 8G, 8G is quite a strong acceleration. Uh, apparently on the highway they drove over a hole or something like this and then suddenly there was a strong excitation. Um, and so this means your van, your car has to deal with this. He has to protect the painting and this means special transportation boxes and many things I will show you later. This was just to give you a little bit an insight what it is about. Now, is art transport a new topic? No, it's not a new topic. Already in the uh, one, um, uh, 300 years ago, uh, Napoleon uh, conquered uh, Egypt and then he stole many pieces of the Egypt art. Um, later also the Germans and the British and many others stole arts from all over the world. And there was always the problem, how can they take these things and bring them back safely to Paris, to London, to Berlin, or wherever they want to keep this. Interesting, in the moment, there's uh, some transportation in the other direction. There are many discussions to give back these pieces of art uh, because they were stolen some time ago, and then uh, in our times, this is not appropriate anymore to have stolen things in your museum. And so there are many discussions going on. But the idea was always the same. You have somehow to protect it. You have to design special cards. You have to make a good vibration, insulation. Of course, people were not so uh, not able to do this in the past. Uh, here you can see something, uh, the Mona Lisa, the most famous painting in the world. Incredible, valuable. Nobody could pay this if there's a damage. Nobody would even touch the Mona Lisa anymore and move it away from Paris in France, where it is in a museum in the Louvre. At this time, when the picture was taken, apparently they were still they still dared to touch it and still dared to do something. But uh, then this handling of these big pictures is, of course, also a problem. If you look carefully, you can see here a rope to stabilize it. Just imagine what happens if the rope breaks or one of the works is not careful. So uh, a lot of things to do. 
Um, and basically, we do very similar things today. We somehow try to pack it, we have to load it, but now we have a lot of measurement devices in addition to see whether this is really a good idea. Okay, and so um, we tried to have a closer look at these transportation boxes. And these transportation boxes are uh, made from wood, they are extremely carefully manufactured, very nice devices, and the surprising thing for us, they are not adjusted to a certain picture, but the companies want to have basically one type of box for everything. And as engineers, we know if something is heavy, you need a different kind of vibration insulation compared to if something is very light, or if there is shaking all over the picture or the, uh, the painting, it's different compared to if only the frame is shaking, and all these little details. And at the moment, that is, this is not represented in what the companies are doing. So we want to measure this, and we want to find uh, some signals, so as engineers, that we can see, okay, this is an acceleration of this and this. This may be dangerous, may, may be not dangerous, but we not want to talk just we think that it's good or we think that it's bad. No, we want to have clear numbers and facts so that we can work. Okay, so <clears throat> then we took one of the boxes, and then we uh, glued there some acceleration sensors uh, and other things uh, to get information. Then another problem arises. Usually, you can only attach something to the frame because the canvas, the painting, is valuable. You cannot attach anything there. Uh, as I told you, we are not even allowed to touch the painting. Um, and so uh, here... Uh, you can only get the frame motion, but you are not knowing what is happening on the canvas. Is this the same motion as for the frame or not? And it's very different, as it turned out. And if we use uh, a painting which is, has no artistic value, like this one here, uh, then we can even see a little bit what's going on on the canvas. But um, all this is moving, and so you can imagine that it's very difficult to make serious measurements in a moving car. Usually you want to have a, a ground, where you do some measurements in an inertial frame, as we call it in mechanics, and uh, therefore you have to go to the lab. I will explain you in a moment how it worked. But many sensors are attached to this, and then uh, they took it and then tried to simulate an art transport. People who know what to do prepared it exactly as if it would be done for a museum transport, but all the time we did our measurements here. Finally, we loaded it in our car. We wanted to have typical data and measurements, so therefore we selected different kinds of roads. Uh, there are German highways, which are usually of good quality, there are some rural roads, there are city roads, there are old-fashioned roads, there are new roads, um, all kinds of things. And so they started here at point A, which is our university, um, and then <coughs> uh, they drove... No, yeah, he here is a... These are separate maps. Uh, then they drove to Böblinger and Sindelfingen. This is, for example, where Daimler has its huge production plant for producing cars. They took the highway to going to Leonberg, in about this area I am living. They drove through the medieval center of Leonberg to get some measurements, and they drove back over some rural roads. Here it's going down very steep, here it's going up very steep. Then they ended in B. Uh, B is a typical German beer garden. I have not the slightest idea what my colleagues and my co-workers measured at laboratory. Here, to give you some impression how these measurements look like, a city street, a highway, autobahn, a rough road, cobblestone road. And so the signals and levels are very different. And also we saw that what is happening on the painting and what is happening Recording on the frame stopped. is also quite different. Uh, the frame and the box works uh, similar to a filter, uh, to a signal filter. Some things are emphasized, some are weakened, and so uh, it's good to have now this kind of information. Okay, let me continue with another thing, and later I will bring all this together, i show you. This is a transportation of a painting on wood. Um, the start was also um, similar, it was a phone call, and it was very emotional. Uh, the responsible art conservator for this painting, uh, she's uh, a lady in her late f 30s or so. Um, she is responsible for this painting and she called 
um, we have a serious problems. There is a painting. It's very expensive. It's very old. It's very sensitive and fragile. And we have to move it to another museum. Then she started nearly to cry. Uh, and my boss told, I told my boss, we cannot transport it. It will break and it will be damaged. And uh, so it will be gone forever. Uh, and, but my boss is so mean, he insists that I transport it and that we have to do it. Okay, and then we discussed a little bit what to do. Um, the options. So maybe we can kill her boss. Um, so if we kill her boss, maybe nobody would even notice that the painting is not transported. But killing somebody is not legal and we get troubles with police. Okay, so we not selected this option. Uh, taking the picture, bringing it at home, moving it to my basement or so, also not a good option because then we have to move the painting to my basement and to hide it there, also not a good option. And so we thought about several things and then it turned out that it's better to try our best to protect the painting as good as possible. Now the painting itself, it's uh, about three meters wide, uh, about two meters high, 150 high, so a big thing. And the bad thing is, uh, it, the thickness is only about uh, a wooden board of about three millimeters. Very, very thin. So if you touch Recording this, in the progress. frame, not the painting, of course, uh, it's very deformable, very flexible. It was done 500 years ago, 1520 about, uh, when it was painted. We have no idea why they did this stupid design with mechanical design with this very thin wooden board. Um, but uh, today, it's really horrible. It was not moved for more than 100 years. It is in a museum in, in Munich and was not moved. At the back, you can see there are all this kind of wooden bars uh, in the in back going back and forth. Uh, this was to stabilize this wooden bar. And uh, here you can see a side view of this. Um, <coughs> it's worse because the painting is in three pieces which are glued together somehow 500 years ago. And now, uh, what happens if you have such a big board? Of course, it breaks. <laughs> yeah, over the years it breaks. So therefore, people made this, and you can see here, uh, it was obviously broken here in this region. So what have the people done? They just glued a second piece of wood there to make it stronger. Now, as engineers, we know if you make it stronger in one point, the stresses will grow, go up at another point. Okay, so then now it's not breaking uh, here, but it's breaking a little bit on top of this. And, and so it's a very in nice engineering problem. Uh, yeah, the people in the museum not thought it's such a nice problem. Uh, they just wanted to have the painting not damaged. Okay, then we uh, discussed a lot, and our idea was um, we have to keep the deformation and have to kind of freeze the deformation during transport. So if something is moving, then there's a change, and changes are not what paintings like. So therefore, we have to freeze the deformation. But it's not possible to just clamp it, because if you clamp it, you will damage the surface. Okay, so there we had to think about solutions. And one solution is, was not to have it straight, but to rotate the whole thing a little bit. This is completely against what people in art and transportation believe. Usually, these pieces of art are always in standing form, always uh, vertical, and always in the direction of travel. This is, so to say, the Bible of art transportation. And now we had the idea, no, not vertical, rotate it for 30, 40 degree. So a lot of discussion, as you can imagine, uh, but it turned out to be a very good idea because then gravity helped us to keep it stable. So then we tried to design a transportation frame. It was the first time done in, in such a way uh, there were some elements behind which are supporting this, very finely adjusted. Uh, there are nice devices to clamp it from the side in a very careful way not to touch the surface and so on. And then it turned out we have to do simulations and computations. Just having good ideas not sufficient. For example, you need to know the eigenfrequency. If you excite the eigenfrequency of such a painting, the amplitudes will be high. High amplitudes high potential damage. Okay, finite element model need to be done. Okay, the museum people thought about finite element, what is finite element? We want to transport a painting and not make simulations. But finally they agreed, and so we selected the boundary conditions in such a way to avoid resonances. So here the painting, 
Here the painting in the museum in Munich, everything was still okay. Some of our equipment which we built for this thing. And so over several days, our staff members tried to do this. Uh, it was sometimes very tiring. Ifa is nearly sleeping here because during the day the museum was open and so most of the work need to be done in the night. Um, and so finally, it, step by step, uh, the frame was attached, the frame was adjusted uh, very carefully. By the way, this is one technician of our workshop and um, he's a very special person. He's Steve, he cannot hear anything. Uh, but he's an absolute genius. Um, he, when usually you, you tell them what you want, and then uh, he thinks what is the best solution. It's wonderful to have these kind of people. And it's important also for you, uh, for, uh, for I'm talking about the young students here, um, have respect for the, these people in the workshop. Um, they don't have your education. They are not engineers, or they have not a PhD or so but some of them are extremely good and they are really doing responsible work. So it's always a good idea to have high respect for these people and uh, we are very happy to have him in our team. Okay, and then the painting was transported. Everything is narrow in this museum. It was brought to a big box with special isolation for the vibrations. Uh, then it was brought to another museum, very, uh, very narrow staircases. It moves, was moved up. Here you can see already the outer box removed and the inner frame there. And here the painting is in the new museum. Everything went well, nothing was destroyed. And once again, this painting was considered as absolutely not transportable before. So it was a good decision not to kill her boss, uh, but uh, to try to make this transportation possible. Another example I want to show you. <coughs> um, in Germany, we have several World Heritage Sites. Uh, one of them is the Herzogin Amalia Library in Weimar in uh, Germany. Uh, for example, our most famous writer was, one was once in the past 200 years ago librarian in this building, in this very famous old library. And it's really beautiful. And they wanted to make an exhibition there with Kranach pictures. Kranach is one of the famous painters in the world. The value of such a picture is many, many million uh, dollars, uh, so really expensive things. And once again, once of their kind, if it's gone, if it's damaged, then they are gone forever. So this is the library building. And unfortunately, in front of the building, there's a street. And on the street, there are cars, there are buses, sometimes even vans driving. And the big question was now, uh, are the vibrations coming from the street uh, to the exhibition room serious. Will they damage the building or not? This was what they was, uh, were asking us. And of course, they had no idea how they should judge this. And so the idea was, we want to make measurements and to see what is really going on. Um, so, so we brought our measurement equipment. We often use laser Doppler vibrometers. Laser Doppler vibrometers are very nice measurement devices. Basically, they send out a laser ray to a vibrating surface. The ray is reflected going back to this device. And from the signal, from the frequency changes, you can find out uh, how this is moving. These devices are extremely sensitive. For example, about 50 meters below our building, there's a subway uh, going. Um, of course, you do not feel anything 50 meters below the building, solid rock be behind. Uh, but in our measurements, we see every single subway arriving uh, in, uh, and driving in to, uh, through this station. Or um, in high quality measurements, we see every person walking around in the building. So therefore, sometimes if you have really very fine measurements, you need to do them at night when nobody is around. Be careful, really check, is there a light going on in some of the, of the rooms? Then you say, oh, no, I have to wait another hour for making the measurements. So these are extremely high uh, quality and very highly sensitive devices. The big advantage of laser Doppler vibrometers is that you do not touch the surface. You just send a laser ray there, it's reflected. You do not attach anything. If you have an accelerator, accelerometer, an acceler usual acceleration sensor, you have to glue it to some place. And then you're changing the dynamics if you're adding mass. With vibrometers, you can do it without touching. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful devices. 
Okay, and then they had this kind of supports designed by people who are in arts, so they, uh, they think they look very nice. And when we saw them, we thought, oh, they do not look at all nice because you can see as an engineer immediately, oh, this is high, this is very thin, this will vibrate. Not the street is the problem, this is, this is the problem. But of course, we tried to make both things and did our measurement. I will show you some results in a moment. Here you see another thing which is very nice. Um, so you can see the hand, and the hand is shaking now one of these paintings a little bit. And um, when you look a little bit uh, longer, then you will see that suddenly this painting here is also vibrating. So the energy is moving from this frame to the next frame back and forth. Beautiful. We teach this our students in the fifth semester what it, this is about in vibrations. Of course, people in the museum, they do not know about these kind of things. So we were ha very happy to see this really for a real system and not just for an academic thing. They were not so happy because this means there is a coupling between the different paintings and the coupling comes via this frame on the floor of the building. Everything is protected there. <clears throat> what would be the solution for an engineer? Okay, drill a hole, then really make it strong to the wall. You cannot simply drill a hole in a museum in a protected building. Um, it's not even allowed to put something to the floor. You need something in between the floor and your measurement devices. And this must be certified that it's not damaging the floor. Uh, so everything is a little bit complicated there. Um, <clears throat> again, we did simulations. So uh, here, um, simple finite element simulations, where we have some vibrating frames. You can see coupling over there, an excitation coming here. Um, and so it's important to have a feeling what is going on. And then you can do measurements to confirm whether you are right. If the measurements show you the same as your simulations, then you can be sure that the simulation is powerful enough, that all the important concepts are included. Here, of course, the vibrations are quite small. So, for example, linear material is sufficient. Okay, as engineer, we know, okay, linear material is much simpler to deal with. But if you have large amplitudes, then you need nonlinear material descriptions. Clear for us engineers, but uh, you always need to be sure that whatever you do in your simulation has a good base in physics, not just make colorful pictures and videos. It must be related to the truth, and the truth is the real system. Okay, we set up the system, made our laser Doppler measurements there, and we also did ground measurements. Here you can see a part of this famous old library, and then we glued some with special glues, so not just taking arbitrary things, we glued some special accelerometers here to the ground, these guys here. They are larger than usual ones because for ground vibrations they are very slow. And if you have slow vibrations, you need big masses to be excited. So therefore, these are larger than our usual accelerometers. And then we try to see what is happening in the museum. I want to give you a few examples of what is happening here. So for example here, um, sorry for the German description, so it simply means time, and this is an acceleration. Here we started our measurement. After about 50 minutes, the museum was opened. Okay, so we were able to see here acceleration peaks when the first people came in, all the doors were opening, and so on. And then people were watch, uh, walking around in this library, uh, sometimes stronger accelerations, sometimes smaller accelerations. And for example, just if they are talking, uh, to each other, you get these accelerations here. So just talking in a museum um, makes already some disturbance. Okay, the solution is obvious. <coughs> Close the museum, let nobody in the museum, then there is no disturbance. Of course, the purpose of a museum is that people go in and watch there, so our proposal was rejected. People must go there. Um, these are measurements when people are walking around in the museum, when there are steps. And sometimes you see there are quite strong accelerations. Um, in our time, some of the museums think it's a good idea to uh, open the museum for some events. So as a company, you, you can pay a lot of money to the museum, and then you can make your anniversary celebration or whatever in the museum. <coughs> Maybe there's even a dancing group making some performances. Is it a good idea? No, not so good if you look at the accelerations which are happening here. 
And also, we were able to see, for example, here, we monitored the street in front of the building. These kind of peaks here, they were from cars driving in front of the uh, building around. Okay, but um, the interesting thing was, all this is in a level which can be dealt with. So all this is not dangerous for the painting. So neither the cars outside, nor the people inside, nor talking, nor walking around. So therefore, we were able to um, tell them, okay, everything is fine. Don't worry about the building itself. But of course, we had to improve these holdings, the, these structures for the paintings themselves. So there are different ways to, uh, in re uh, to reinforce them, to improve them. Uh, we can add some masses, we can add uh, some stiffening structures, and this is really pure engineering. So, so for example, we asked them, uh, can you please bring us a little bit of sand? Sand is very nice, you can nicely pack it somewhere, you can close, the way. you can place it somewhere, sand is heavy. Okay, then they brought us about one cubic meter of sand. We were more thinking about two bags of sand or something like this, but they really brought us a large pile of sand. And then, for example, by adding some additional mass uh, to the structures, like this one here, uh, you were able to remove the coupling of vibrations. Coupling of vibrations happens if eigenfrequencies are close together. If you change the eigenfrequencies by adding mass, you are remo uh, moving the eigenfrequencies far away, and then the coupling vanishes. A very simple engineering idea. You do not need one cubic meter of sand, of course. Um, these two bags were sufficient for this. Later they were hidden. You will not see them as a person attending the exhibition. And so we did some small improvements here. Um, also, again, did me simulations, did measurements. And so finally the exhibition was opened. Here you can see some pictures. So um, it's now really beautiful, really nice. Uh, people can go there, can see it. The paintings seem to be well protected and everybody is happy. Okay, so now you can see a little bit what it is about and what has art and engineering to do with each other. We, we are not responsible for doing a nice painting. I cannot do it uh, myself, but we are, can be helpful for protecting these kind of things. Let me give you a few details and uh, more technical things. So, <coughs> for example, when you look at such paintings, there are different things happening. For example, if this canvas is vibrating here, moving up and down, then the surface is going back and forth. Uh, these paint layers are sometimes several hundred years old, so they are very, very fragile. And then sometimes this happens. Maybe even this is falling away. But this is not the worst thing which can happen. The worst thing are there where stress concentrations are building up. <coughs> so here you can see this vibration, uh, this painting vibrate. So we excited it with loudspeakers and with shakers. Of course, you are not allowed to do this with an expensive uh, painting which has artificial uh, art value. Okay, <coughs> I already mentioned the climate chamber. We had to think about good clamping devices. We had to think about ways how to. Uh, define how, how to define and how to set up uh, well-defined prototypes of different parameters and different kinds. Uh, <coughs> we need signal generators, we need measurement devices, and suddenly it's a very nice engineering test bed, uh, which we have available here, force sensors, stingers, and so on and so on. And then we can do measurements and we can analyze what is happening here. I do not want to go into details. For example, you do measurements uh, by changing the humidity in this measurement chamber and see uh, are the accelerations changing or not. Is the front and the back side of the uh, painting the same? Many things can be done here. Then there was an idea. Um, I already told you stresses and strains are uh, difficult because they can cause damage. So can we find out stresses and strains on a painting again without touching it? How, what can we do? And here are some measurement devices by Polytech. Um, so they provided in their lab these four nice devices. Um, you can see here, well, you just these four devices, this is about one million uh, US dollar uh, worth. So these are really very, very expensive devices. That's why it was good that Polytech was in the company, was interested in this and was helping us. 
Uh, so we also have two of these guys, but not four of them, so we cannot afford this. Here was a shaker. We prepared some probes of some test paintings. We were shaking them, and the question was, can we identify the stresses and strains correctly? Okay, here are some first measurements. I will show you uh, some results in a moment. And this is what it looks like. First, you have the measurement on the left and uh, the computation on the right. And uh, the overall picture is already quite good, so the quality is fine. For example, for strains, we have 20, 220 uh, in the measurement, 236 in the, exper uh, in the finite element simulation. This is reasonable, this agreement. In the center, it's even uh, better. But still, if you look more careful, you can find out that your stress and strain fields uh, look quite messy, like this one's here. And the reason is uh, the fabric below. It's painted on fabric li like this, and of course there are fibers and structures and certain directions which are important or not important. And so you not have simply a painting on a material like a metal blade where the, uh, there is no anisotrophy. Um, so therefore the directions are important. So we need much fancier finite element models. More to do, which is always a good news. So in research, it's always uh, not so nice if you have finished a project and all questions are answered. Now th then you feel sad, um, what should I do now? Just sitting at home is also not an option. So it's always nice if you make a research project and at the end of the project, there are more questions open than at the very beginning. Then you know, okay, this is an interesting topic where you can continue and find out a lot of additional things. Or <coughs> uh, we uh, try to make these test samples uh, and then here you can see notches. And so if we let this vibrate, of course it should break somewhere here. But when will it break and under which conditions will it break? Will it break after 1,000 vibrations or after 100,000 vibrations? What is the amplitude and so on? Um, by the way, here on the bottom you can also see this tall person. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the chairman of one of the largest foundations in Germany. They run a private art museum uh, with Im uh, paintings of millions and millions and millions value. Uh, so he's one of the per important persons in art. And they are very much interested in, in engineering, which is very nice uh, for us uh, that the communities mix. Okay, here you can see uh, how such a small test bed works. So here is the shaker. Here is a high-speed camera. Here is the sample, which looks like this one here. And then this is shaking, and a, a laser Doppler vibrometer, this one here, is always watching this. Now, um, <coughs> of course, if something is breaking, then you want to stop immediately and analyze it. And unfortunately, such things, they run for days and days, maybe weeks. They always break during the weekend and in the nights when you are not around. You cannot watch them uh, always. They, they, they should maybe break Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock or so, but they never do this. So therefore, you need an automated system which is always taking um, uh, video signals, analyzing these video signals, and if this um, automated system detects that there is a major change, like a breaking, then it should switch off the system so that you know what was happening. So you can imagine there's a lot of things to do many, many details. I, I was happy to see that, for example, here there is this nice mechatronics laboratory where also students set up many of these things and they also have to solve all these problems. They have to do electronics and they have sensors and actuators and program everything, set up a mechanical structures, think about the programming and about the analysis. These kind of things are so important for us engineers uh, to have really this a uh, kind of complete picture. Okay, so now um, the final slide for this first talk. This one here, some conclusions. Before I uh, come to this, I want to uh, present you a little bit more the complete picture. So we have measurements about the real transport. With these measurements about the real transport, we can now go into our laboratory and simulate the transport in our laboratory environment. This is much more convenient, for, of course. And then we do the experiment in the laboratory and see what is the real painting doing in our laboratory. Thank you very much. 
uh, what is it doing in our laboratory, and then we can analyze carefully what is responsible for it and how can we protect this. Now, uh, the slide. Uh, so what do we need to investigate these kind of things? We need measurements, we see simulations, uh, so that we know precisely the dynamics during such a transportation of art. We need experiments in the laboratory, but we always need simulation models. In the second talk afterwards, uh, you will see uh, that simulation is the most important tool for us. It's even more important than measurements, I would say, nowadays. And this is absolutely necessary also here. And then uh, we have to perform hardware in the loop experiments to find out what we cannot see during transport. We need uh, to make measurements and simulation of the damage of many kinds of paintings and piece art. And we need a lot of feedback and insight into reality from our partners. Uh, we are now very happy. We made several publications and presentations. Uh, so people in art know our institute in the meanwhile. So for example, at the moment, we have a very interesting new project going on. It's with a big m new museum in Rotterdam in uh, the Netherlands. So even abroad, uh, we get contacts. And they want to see, is the new museum suitable for events? Is it uh, possible that hundreds of people at the same time are in this building or not? And so it's very, very interesting for us uh, to be part of these discussions and these things. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, once again, we will make now a few minutes break. Um, so here's already some water or so. Um, so and then after the break, I will continue with a completely different topic, which is more about modeling and simulation and the hand dealing with very complex phenomena uh, we have in materials and in production. Thank you very much. If you have questions, you can ask me either now or you can come to me. And uh, once again, the offer, if somebody is interested, uh, just send me an email or just come to my office when I'm here around. And I'm, uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you, to some of you I already talked to. I uh, know the faces and what they are doing. Okay, thank you very much, and we continue in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, aging is a very, very serious problem um, because if you make these samples, uh, the, this is fresh paint. And then um, the behavior of fresh paint and old paint is very different. Um, so uh, we have, for example, a special oven uh, where we can accelerate this aging. So either you can use this oven to heat up pizza or uh, you can uh, use the oven to heat up paintings and then you get an artificial aging. The important thing is uh, the moisture should be brought to a defined level. And this level is, of course, very different in Sri Lanka and in Germany. And, and so the clearly defined level is, is important. Uh, but there are several projects around which deal with aging of paint. And also about the fact brick below. Just imagine um, a material, if I let this uh, 500 years in a museum, the behavior is completely different. It's completely brittle and breakable material. <laughs> Uh, we tried it in, a, in other projects. Um, um, wh when, when you d let me just remove this for a moment. Um, when you do uh, with such things, uh, you must go step by step. Um, at the moment, most of the people are not even aware that uh, this vibration protection is important. They think a very nicely produced box is sufficient and then everything is fine. So, uh, therefore, we have to convince them that vibration and insulation is important at all. Then they think that, okay, we do it once and then it's okay to, and we can use it for everything. No, this is not the case. The vibration insulation must be done uh, differently depending on geometrical dimension, on weight and excitation level and so on. So this means a kind of personalization of sure. this uh, isolation thing. This is where we are at the moment working with the companies a lot. 
And then uh, the next level would be, of course, active vibration damping, where you measure uh, disturbances and then do counter vibration. Uh, right. High uh, damping. And then if it degrees out of space, like yeah. right, right. Uh, yeah, it, it, this is a, a good idea, and uh, it can be done, but uh, the efforts rise more and more. And I think the question of how fragile the transportation good is and how expensive it is and what is the damage risk. The more dangerous it is, the more uh, people are willing to spend and effort and time and money. It's at the wrong places. Um, but uh, the, the big problem is, for example, if a gimbal is going around the corner, uh, then it tries to keep the system stable. But if you drive, for example, around the corner, you want to, the transportation box to follow nicely the street, of course. So therefore, such gimbal systems are interesting uh, when p uh, things are stationary. Um, in Paris, for example, they built a museum directly on top of an old uh, subway station. So a nice engineering metal structure, but of course a lot of disturbances coming from the street and from the from this, uh, ground. And uh, there uh, such gimbal systems would be interested, interesting. They did everything with double walls and vibration insulation in between. Uh, but uh, for moving for long distance, uh, this is a little bit critical. But um, you have to collect all kinds of ideas and then select the best one. I always think it's not a good idea uh, to decide after a few minutes not to do something. First, uh, try to get many options and then kind of evaluate what are the good options, what are not good options. But if you throw away options too early, maybe you lost the, the best one. So, so be careful with too fast decisions. <laughs> yeah, I was also asked about um, active systems, controlled systems, also a good solution, but of course a little bit more expensive. And in our times, um, for example, control system always need energy. And you not want to switch on something which is consuming energy 24 hours a day, even if it's a little energy. So you prefer usually passive systems uh, if you have it for, use them for a long time. Yeah, this is a very, very good point. Um, so if, if an engineer would paint, make a painting, uh, he would make one layer in one color and making sure that the thickness is everywhere the same. So this is a very nice engineering structure and then you can do a lot of computations, uh, but uh, the painting will not be so successful and not so beautiful. <laughs> so artists have all kinds of strange ideas. Sometimes they mix the paint with sand to get a special structure. Uh, sometimes they use different materials. Uh, sometimes the artists don't have uh, money, so they use very poor quality paint and all these kind of things. And so uh, it's extremely difficult to consider all this in a simulation model. We have to look carefully what can we include, what are the main effects. And I think our, the next thing which we need to include is the structure of the textile support. Um, this is something which is nearly everywhere, and uh, getting the structure of the textile support will help us a lot. And then we need some typical uh, situations where we can do measurements and make system identification. Uh, but I have not much hope that we can predict completely arbitrary pictures. Even the um, the time when a painting was produced is different because people use different techniques in different times. So a specialist can tell you from a painting, okay, this was painted in uh, 1870, for example. I do not see it. I'm not a specialist. But, but they, they know it very precisely because the properties are different. Mm -hmm. But there's a long, long way to go to this. But um, I have not mentioned why this is so interesting. Um, when a piece of art is moved from one museum to the next one, um, it can be damaged. And so you go to an insurance company and ask them, okay, we pay you a lot of insurance money, and then if something is broken, you have to repair it. 
And these insurance fees go up tremendously. And so in the future, it will be more and more difficult to organize exhibitions of famous paintings because the insurance money is going up so, so incredibly. And this is serious. So, for example, the last few months I spent in New Zealand, in Christchurch. And maybe you remember in Christchurch a few years ago, about 10 years ago, there was a big, a big earthquake. Many people died. The whole city center was destroyed. And in the city center, there was one building completely undamaged, completely undamaged. And this was a building with glass windows, everything. So apparently a fragile building. It was the art museum. And why was the art museum not damaged? Uh, the art museum was on a big block of concrete, and then they had vibration isolation devices in between the ground and the museum itself. Of course, this is an expensive, expensive thing to do, but it worked beautifully. And then when Christchurch was rebuilt, uh, the military and the police and all the, these guys had their offices in the art gallery because this was the only really completely undamaged building. And now the question came, why have they done this vibration insulation? Um, this was to save insurance money. Uh, they were able to show the insurance company, okay, we have here a perfect insulation system. If, our if there's an earthquake, our paintings will not be damaged. And so they had only to pay only very low insurance money. And that was the reason why it was worth to make these things. And a few years later, it was shown that it worked very beautifully. So if you have the chance to go there, um, th th you can do something which, um, yeah, it's a little bit strange. Um, yeah, I mentioned we in engineers are strange persons. Usually people go there, walk into the museum, make photos, are very enthusiastic. Um, <clears throat> I went there, uh, went to the uh, underground garage, was very enthusiastic, made a lot of photos of the vibration isolation <laughs> system. <laughs> People are more, uh, really wondered, oh, why, what, what is this strange guy? The paintings are upstairs, why are I making photos here <laughs> in the garage? But there was this vibration system. And so um, it often pays off to invest a lot of brain and money to protect against isolation. This art gallery in New Zealand in Christchurch is a beautiful example for, for this. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, there were, they, they told me there was a lot of discussion before, should we really spending this extra money for this uh, isolation? And then uh, the big argument was not that uh, it's safer against earthquake. It, the argument was we can save a lot of money, which otherwise goes to the insurance companies. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, although I have quite a lot of experience in vibration, but I'm not there to say which thick signals are not critical and which ones are critical. Sometimes uh, the frequency range is important. So the vibration is very small, but in a bad frequency range. And then suddenly small things which you hardly feel can cause trouble. Is it okay for you if we continue with this? Yeah, please. Yes. So industrial versus not industrial, or uh, what? In the maybe transporting into an airplane or something. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
follow if somebody is talking to you or hear a car when it's arriving. So um, therefore, it's good. And um, there's a famous hospital in Germany, in Cologne, doing this kind of medical operations. And they found out that uh, patients leaving their hospital to the north have no trouble. Some of the patients going to the south have trouble. <laughs> so <laughs> what, is, what is the difference? And then um, we investigated this carefully, and there was a very strange effect. And the effect was, uh, usually people after such an operation want to be very relaxed and very safe. So most of them not took a car, but took the train. Bad decision. This was a bad decision. Why? Because the train line from Cologne to the south goes along the Rhine River, and there are some tunnels. Okay, so what happened, <coughs> these people with their freshly operated uh, ear um, sit in the train, entering some tunnels, and suddenly boop, uh, the eardrum was um, ruptured. And this was because of the pressure signals from the tunnels. The air was compressed, and so the, tunnel wa uh, the tri train driving through a tunnel gave this pressure signal which damaged the freely operated thing. So basically, 100 kilometers to the south, they could turn, drive back the same way, <laughs> going again to hospital. And, and so sometimes there are these subtle things uh, where you usually not think about. Uh, so for example here, uh, usually cars, if cars are driving through a tunnel, it's not a problem because there's a lot of air volume be behi um, beside the car. If a train is passing a tunnel, there's only very little air between the tunnel walls and the train. Recording and stopped. You have this pressure changes. Recording uh, in progress. Have different problems. There you have impact like excitations. When they land, there's usually a strong impact. And so you have to take care for more impact protection. And there is not so much um, steady state vibration. S yeah, yeah. All this must be, must be considered carefully. Um, what, what th the good news is that usually you do not have to consider all these effects in a lot of detail. Um, if the decision is not to consider anything and to do at least the best you can do for the moment, you already reached, let's say, 50% of what is possible. And then it's getting more and more difficult to make, uh, to, uh, make improvements. Uh, but in many areas, the first step is missing. And so, uh, for example, here often the first step is what we really want to tell them. Do the first step and then you reached already a lot. For example, add uh, vibration insulation devices. Make them customized. Make them not just a general design used for everything. Make them adjustable to the weight and dimensions and so on. And then you have reached 50%, which is already much more than most of the others can do. Okay, so let me briefly switch to another presentation. Okay, <coughs> yes. Ah, okay, yeah, maybe this is... At the moment, voice is still okay, but... Uh <laughs> Okay, so I want to talk to you now about a completely different topic and also one I want to show you a little bit uh, how we do a lot of our research. Uh, the previous thing was about a very interesting kind of system, a very traditional approach with measurements and simulations and thinking about a clever engineering solution. Uh, this is something which is very, very different, as you will see in a moment, and it's heavily simulation-based. My personal belief is that in our days, you cannot do interesting uh, problems anymore without very good simulations. And simulations are really critical 
because you must make sure that the simulations make sense. Sometimes we see, even in, if we talk to companies, they told us, okay, here we have simulation results. Oh, we are so proud we have simulations, great. Um, then they show us some measurements and the two things have nothing to do with each other. So completely separate realities. And then you ask them, okay, what have you learned from the simulations? Oh, we have learned how to do a simulation and so on. No, this is not the purpose of a simulation. The purpose of a simulation is you want to get insight, you want to understand something. And therefore, if you make simulations of a real system, you want to make sure that your simulation has to represent the reality. And if the reality is not represented, go back to your desk and change and improve your simulation. So you always must make sure what is a responsible physical effect and make sure that this physical effect is included in your simulation. So the purpose of a simulation is not that it's colorful and that there's a nice video or so. The purpose of such a simulation is that you understand something and therefore you have to consider the relevant physics in your model. It sounds so trivial, but it's so tempting if you are sitting in an industry and have not much time, then maybe a colorful picture is sufficient for you. But no, this has no value anymore. Maybe your job is believing, uh, your, your boss is believing you, but just imagine something happens and it turns out that your simulation were completely wrong. This is not what you want to have. So therefore, when you do simulations, make sure to have all the relevant physics included. And the art of simulation is to include not more than the relevant physics not make the most complicated model of all times. Make it as complicated as useful. Okay, now I want to show you some uh, processes um, where it seems to be completely out of simulation. It is about welding, uh, two aspects, laser welding and friction steel welding. And we want to use smooth particle hydrodynamics. I guess most of you have not heard about smooth particle hydrodynamics. I will very briefly explain what it is about. Of course, it's also done together with some of my co-workers. Let me explain first a little bit about methods used. Um, there is, for example, the discrete element method. With the discrete element method, you consider particles. Particles can be, for example, sand, but, for example, also the coating of medical pills is simulated with discrete element methods. If you do this, um, my wife is at the moment taking some Ayurvedic treatments here. And so in the morning and evening, she gets these little pills here. They are very, very bitter. And so uh, she had to, to take these pills. Um, usually people in Germany do not like these bitter pills. What are the companies doing? They cover it with sugar. Um, the sugar has no medical effect. Uh, you take it, it tastes good, like, like sweets or so. Um, if you have it too long in your mouth, the sugar is gone, and then it's bitter again. So, <laughs> um, but, and so it's interesting for pharmacy how to coat, for example, the pills with sugar, so that everything is coated with sugar. And, and these kind of things are simulated these days, not just tried, we can do simulations. Okay, discrete element method is the, th uh, the choice, what you can do. What you are doing, you have all these particles, just imagine little balls like in a pile of sand, and then you see uh, which particles are in contact with each other. If particles are touching each other, then forces are exchanged between the particles. So you compute the interaction forces. And then you integrate the differential equations and make one more time steps. Then you search for the new neighbors. Again, compute the forces and do this again and again and thousands and million times. And then you get the time evolution. Now you need here differential equations. Here, for example, you all know Newton's laws, mass time acceleration is equal to some forces. So if you know the initial positions and you know the mass, then you can uh, compute the forces and then get the next position. This is this basically the same for rotations, Euler's equation. So there are differential equations behind. Okay, now you know we need several things. We need a neighborhood search, which are geometrical algorithms. We need force laws, how to compute the interaction force. And we need the differential equations uh, which are governing the complete system. Okay, and then you can do this. When are you applying such a discrete element method? When the neighborhood is changing. So for example, if I deform this uh, bottle here a little bit, then 
material point here, which is neighboring at the very beginning, is also the neighbor when I make some deformation. Nothing is changing. And so we can use the finite element method. If I have a pile of sand and I shake this pile of sand, then the neighborhoods are changing and then you need something different. For example, the discrete element method. The big problem is how to find the interactions. If you just compare every particle with every other particle, then you run in a problem that the runtime behavior is in uh, order of n square or even n to the power of three. This means if you write such a code <coughs> and you test it with 10 particles, everything works fine. You are enthusiastic. The next day you go to 100 particles, it still works. Okay, a few weeks later you go to 10,000 particles and it's slow and slow and slow. If you go to a million particles, it will not change. So therefore, very serious, you must find algorithms which are fast. So if you double the number of particles, you double the computation time. Power of three would mean, would mean double number of particles, eight times the computation time, which is not acceptable. Okay, you need a, a, a highly efficient algorithms for this. I do not want to go in detail, just give you a little bit of the background. Or another thing we can do is smooth particle hydrodynamics. Uh, this is a, different, uh, a similar concept. You are, you are splitting an area into different elements, but not as in finite elements. The neighbors are still neighbors for all times. Uh, the neighbors, the particles, can move and can change their position. And then you can transfer partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations and do beautiful simulations. And most of it is done um, and used in the videos which I will show you. Just to give you one impression uh, what it is about. Usually you have this integral type of equations. Just make a time derivative and then you have a differential equation. And now you are changing this integral over an area to a summation over neighbors. And this is the basis of this kind of methods. And which, which other neighbors, there are efficient methods to determine this. And then you basically rewrite, for example, the Navier-Stokes equation in SPH form, and then you can simulate the Navier-Stokes equation. Beautiful, really beautiful. Um, in uh, New Zealand, I gave a course about this over two weeks, how to do this uh, precisely. This is a very nice method where you can uh, go away from uh, cell-based uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, to mesh-free methods, and then you will see in a moment what you can do with these kind of methods. Now, if somebody is telling you he has a new method and it has only advantages, then you can be quite sure he's lying. Um, just keep in mind, uh, there are no methods which only have advantages. There are always some disadvantages too. So if somebody is very enthusiastic and tells you, I found the optimal thing in the world, I do not need anything else, and you also not need anything else, then be careful. Um, here, there are many advantages. For example, in computational fluid dynamics, uh, tracking of surfaces, free surface flow, is difficult. This is very simple for this kind of meshless methods. Um, you can describe very large deformations and displacements. You don't need any remeshing. It's very well suited for complex geometry. Um, and even for a small number of particles, you can often get a good description of the global behavior. Wonderful. Many more advantages. But, to be honest, there are also problems. For example, um, there are stability problems. The boundary conditions is a serious problem. Boundary conditions in CFD and finite elements is trivial. Everybody can do it. With meshless methods, boundary conditions are critical. And so uh, when you think about applying a new method, always consider uh, what do I need, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages, and then select a good method. And, but before, think about it. Um, and these meshless methods, I, I will show you many uh, examples. They are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Uh, but be careful. Only use them if you need them. If you don't need them, finite elements, CFD, is easier. It's more stable, better known. So therefore, be always careful. Okay, I, after these few things, I want to show you a little bit what it is about. Okay, laser welding. What is the idea of laser welding? This big ball here is not material. This is the place where the laser ray hits this material, and then it's moving. When the laser ray hits the material, the material is heating up, 
and then the material is melting here. So this is solid material, the blue one, and this reddish material, this is molten material. So you need phase changes going from solid to liquid and from liquid to solid again, going back and forth. Just imagine how you can do this with finite elements. You can hardly do this. Uh, this laser welding is a very nice process uh, because it's extremely flexible and it's widely used in industry. Um, you will not learn it in the education. I saw yesterday your very nice um, uh, metal shop where workshop where you can do the electric welding and gas welding. So the idea is very similar. But with this kind of laser welding, you can get much higher qualities of the weld seam, which is important in many industrial processes. But you need expensive machines for this. So here you see from the top uh, one of these weld seams. Here it looks very nice. Here it looks a little bit different. And this is, if you cut here, this is the side view. Here you have a quite narrow weld. Here it's getting higher. So there must be a change. And what is the change? The change is the laser power. If you increase the laser power more and more, uh, at the very beginning, uh, the material is just melting and it's solidifying again if the laser ray is gone. And then you get this very nice seam here, but it's quite flat. Uh, if you increase the laser power, th then uh, the material is vaporizing. So you, this means um, here you go much deeper. And here in this red area, the material is vaporized. Here's a plasma region, and this material is flowing out. Here, the uh, this area is material which is liquid, and here it's solid again. The laser ray is moving in this direction. So this is called deep penetration welding. So the weld is much deeper, so it's much more strong. But here you have to work a little bit on this to make this beautiful again. So advantages and disadvantages. Now, what do you need if you want to do this? There are many things you need. You have to model the laser beam, laser radiation. You have to model the heat transfer, conduction, convection, radiation. You have to model the solid workpiece with stresses, distortions, the fluid dynamics with surface tension, Marangoni convection, I explain in a moment what it is, fluid structure interaction, mass transfer, phase transitions. All this must be included in your simulation model. And this is why these things are so complicated. Everything needs to be considered. If not, you cannot simulate, it, simulate this process. Now, a few assumptions. For example, you need to define in the solid phase there's thermoelastic behavior, or in the liquid phase you use an incompressible Newtonian fluid. You have to specify some uh, thermal quantities like the heat capacities and um, the laser uh, portions and so on. And then to give you a little bit an insight what you have to do for the solid phase, there are a few equations which are important. For example, the conservation of mass. The first differential equations on the very left top. And this conservation of mass is changed to this equation here. So this is the SPH form of the conservation of mass. So you get basically get rid of derivatives here and replace them by summations here somehow. And this formula is then evaluated for all particles for every time step. Or conservation of linear momentum, this thing here for solid mechanics. Again, you create this SPH form. You, there are some strange terms, artificial stresses, artificial viscosities also included. Then you need a constitutive equation which is also transformed in such a way. <coughs> and if you do all this, then you can simulate it, for example, these two rubber rings, which are moving to each other and are bending very strongly. Uh, the colors correspond uh, more or less to the stresses at a certain point. Uh, this would be uh, doable. You can do simulations like this also with finite elements, of course. But the same can be done with this meshless methods. And then you need more. You need the conservation of energy. Here, for example, Fourier's law of heat conduction must be included, source terms where energy is flowing in. All these kind of things need to be considered. And so uh, when I talked uh, in the last days uh, also to some of the lecturers and professors here, um, I, I always thought that for me a good mathematical education is so important. Uh, when you see these formulas, 
uh, you do not understand them initially. Nobody can. I also cannot understand them from the very beginning. Uh, but all, we all are here in the room. We are not afraid of seeing such formula. If such a formula occurs to you and somebody tells you, okay, you need to do this, you are not afraid. You will be able to deal with it. Just imagine uh, maybe you have a, a friend who is, has not studied engineering or so. If you give him this formula, he will be shocked. Okay, my formula, I do not know what this formula is about. Leave me alone. Uh, no, you are able to understand such things, even if you are not able to understand them immediately. If there is a genius, um, especially among the students, who understands everything immediately, just contact me. I have a job offer for you. <laughs> but um, the, uh, this can not be expected by anybody to understand this immediately. The idea is you must be relaxed. If you work hard, if you read about this, you will be able within a few days to get an understanding for this. Okay, so we can now do solids and heat. And we have to do the same for liquid. Conservation of mass, conservation of linear momentum, these are the Navier-Stokes equations, conservation of energy. All these differential equations need to be stated. They need to be uh, written in SPH form, in this discretized form. They have to be implemented. You need a surface tension model, for example, here. Uh, this drop comes together and then the surface tension is causing now this motion here. And here is a very nice effect. I'm not aware, uh, I was not aware of this, the Marangoni convection. Marangoni convection is happening in the Weltpool. Um, we did some simulations and then we always saw in our simulation that in the liquid material there's a certain motion of material. If the laser goes in this direction, this motion is in this direction. So. And we thought this is a mistake in our simulations. So we investigated this over several weeks. We were not able to get rid of this motion here. And what was the reason of the motion? We had no idea. And then we went to our laser colleagues, um, who usually do experiments only, and then they thought, oh, this is beautiful, this is Marangoni convection. This responsible thing for Marangoni convection is a temperature-dependent surface tension coefficient. So this is a physical effect. This is not a mistake in the simulation, this is a physical effect. And the nice thing is, uh, so basically particles with uh, high temperature are dragged to an arrow to low temperature. And this gives the motion in the whirlpool. Uh, for us, the fast, or for me, the fascinating thing was, we not know the effect. We wasted several weeks to investigate how to get rid of this effect. So we were not aware of this. But then it turned out that this was physics. This means our model was powerful enough and contained all the physical things required to describe this effect. And, and this is a good sign. So usually it's quite the opposite, that you do simulations and you find, oh no, something is happening which is not included. Here it was the opposite. The physics was included, but we not understood the physics. And so make the model powerful enough to have all the physics included. So it's not about colorful pictures, it is about considering the physics. Okay, then you have the phase transitions based on some enthalpy methods. You have to define all these kind of things, when to go from solid to liquid and back and so on. You have some fluid structure interaction. You have temperature dependent material parameters. For example, if a, a material is heating up, usually its volume is getting larger. So you have to consider these volume changes when the temperature is changing. These are temperature dependent material parameters. And also the laser ray. The first idea was just add all the laser energy in one point. This is not a good idea. If a lot of energy is entered in one point, then you suddenly have an explosion because um, it's overheating immediately and then uh, it's not the correct thing. Laser is the energy is distributed over a certain area. Some of it is reflected, some absorbed, some transmitted. It's depending on the depth of the material and many more things. So now you get an impression how difficult it is to set up a reasonable model for a complicated process like this. But I want to motivate you. If you want to simulate only simple things, then it's easy to do. But the simple things have also been done by many others. So you will not be able to write a good research paper about simple things. Other people did it before. So therefore, in the future, you have to do complicated things. I'm in my mid-50s, so I have maybe 15 more years to work. Um, so maybe I can survive with the level I have now. You as students, doctoral students, 
You cannot. You are in maybe in your mid-twenties, and so you have 45 years to go. Therefore, you have to think now about complicated things and how to deal with complicated things in the future. Um, and you will see it's a lot of fun to do complicated things. So uh, don't be shy about this. So <clears throat> now if you do deep penetration laser welding, situation gets even worse. For example, if there is this uh, capillary uh, where the material is vaporizing and leaving the simulation, um, and the liquid is coming from outside, then it would fill immediately the capillary. And then the capillary is gone. So there's therefore a recoil pressure. There's a pressure pressing the liquid out of the capillary, and you have to compute this. That's <clears throat> okay, so we do all this together with our colleagues from the Laser Institute. Uh, they set up the ray tracer required. We did the SPH simulations. Geometries were sent back and forth, temperatures, energy distributions, and so on. All this was supported by the German Research Foundation. And I want to jump over this, just give you an idea how this capillary looks like. So this is a typical capillary. Um, so here from the top, there is the laser ray, and this, the content is empty. Here is just the gas, which is um, a vaporized material. Outside of this thing is either liquid or solid. Uh, now, you can see here, for example, if you look carefully, here are some steps in, in this image. Again, something. Why, why are there steps? Is this a step something just a simulation thing? Did we make a mistake because there is a step? So again, we walked to our laser people, showed it to them. No, these steps are physical, and I will show you later some images where you can see them. So if you have them in your simulation, this means your simulation has a good quality, the physics is included. So these steps are interesting, and these steps are moving up and down, by the way, uh, if we do this simulation. Okay, now a first simulation. Uh, first, low power laser. Uh, so here it's directed, the laser is moving here. This is liquid material now. This is solid material uh, again. The blue one is, is solid but was never liquid, and so it's moving back and forth. If you cut here, you can measure the depth, for example. So this is a first simulation um, where everything I mentioned before kind of came together. Okay, now we have to check, of course, whether this makes sense and whether this is reasonable. So for example, we try to find out about the temperatures which are there. Um, and uh, compare the temperatures in the weld pool, for example, with uh, what we have for measurements. Uh, or we were able to uh, see the depth of the thing. So uh, this is solid material again. So how thick is this one here? And then again, compare it to experiments. Here, by the way, you can see the number of SPH particles over time. So it's more or less constant here. Uh, there's the fluid and the, uh, the evaporated. And this will change in a moment tremendously when we go to this other mode of welding, this deep penetration. So we increased the laser power, did the same simulations again, and we can see here this is much bigger now because the laser power was higher. Um, and also here you can see the evaporated particles. This is the other ones which are gas and leave the simulation. It's of course, increasing highly, which was not the case before, because in the other mode, there was no gas. Now, are the results good or net, uh, not? Here you have an experimental curve, the blue one. We have the simulation curve, the red one. And so they agree more or less. Is this more or less sufficient or not? Um, here you can see two analytical solutions. Usually, the analytical solutions are the best ones you have. So this one here. This is another analytical solution. This means this situation is so complicated that you are really happy to have this close results. Um, you cannot expect more. So this one here is uh, one experts developed over decades, thought about over decades. This is worse than, much worse than the experiment. So our simulation is much closer. So therefore, uh, we have a lot of trust in this kind of things. I will jump over the next things, adaptive refinement, so to make them uh, more precise and less precise in areas where, where you need it. I want to concentrate more on something else. Now, uh, the issue is um, 
whenever there's a nice process and the process is working, people in industry are thinking hard, how can we improve it? And one thing to improve is to make an oscillating laser power. Not to have always the same power, but make it a stronger, weaker, stronger, weaker. And this gives you a much nicer situation. For example, you can get wider uh, weld seams and a stronger connection. So we can simulate this. A and now it becomes predictive. When we do simulations, we want to have predictive simulations. We not just want to create images and videos, we want to make predictions about the future. So when they ask us, uh, is it good to oscillate this laser beam fast or slow, then we want to show them, okay, we made a simulation experiment, make it in this frequency, and then it's optimal. I want to not want to go over this de into too much detail. Now, there's an um, interesting thing. How can we do this experimentally? How can we compare experimentally? Several things can be done easily. For example, uh, if we have let the workpiece cool down, and then we can polish it and make measurement about the width and about the depth. This is simple. This is static information. But can we look into the system? And there are a few options which you have. One option which is quite surprising is welding of ice. Ice has quite similar properties as aluminium. So if you compare welding in ice and compare welding in aluminium, the behavior is very similar. Uh, ice has the nice um, advantage. Of course, it's cheap, but uh, the even better, it's transparent, so you can look in inside the ice, which you cannot into aluminium. There are possibilities to make X-ray investigations, for example, uh, of situations. There you can also look into workpieces, but ice is, of course, much nicer and easier to use. And here you can see uh, welding in ice. So here is lasery coming down. This one here is liquid water now, the liquidified material. This is solid ice, the solid thing. And you can see at the very bottom, these kind of vibration is occurring, spiking. Uh, it's called spiking. And uh, so this is something which you also want to compare between simulation and experiment. And we can have stable simulations so or situation, so this is a stable situation. Here you can see a very wild behavior. It's an unstable thing. If you make unstable welding, you get a lot of splashes of material all around the place, and you do not want to have this. So you can in consider all these kind of things in uh, these simulations and uh, the experiments in ice. <coughs> or also here you can see, um, so this is the capillary, uh, you can see that these steps are moving downward. The same can also be observed in the real videos of the real uh, system to think. So again, the agreement is very good. And at the moment, uh, we are investigating very carefully uh, what is happening not only at the front, but also at the back of this capillary. Again, with uh, some funding of the German Research Foundation. Okay, so these spikes can be compared the steps, the moving steps can be compared, so there are nice things to do. <coughs> uh, now, the next step is laser cutting. Uh, in laser cutting, you not want to weld, not bring the things together, but you want to cut materials. And when you do laser cutting, the problem is at the bottom. At the bottom, instabilities make very, very ugly uh, kind of uh, things where you make have to smoothen everything later and so on. So, therefore, this is more complicated a thing we have to do now. Okay, so <coughs> uh, I wanted to show you here in this laser welding part uh, something where you need many things in your simulations and the basic message is not laser welding. The basic message is when you do simulations, make them carefully and think hard what should be included, how can you check the validity of your simulation and uh, how can you make sure that your simulation is able to make predictions. And I'm personally absolutely convinced that you go more and more into simulations. And I think this is also a nice chance for a university like Moratuva. Um, I mentioned before some of the vibration measurement equipment. This is extremely expensive stuff. Uh, so you need a lot of money to buy these uh, devices. For simulations, you mainly need clever persons. You need a lot of brain. And a lot of brain is available here. And so uh, use this. I think uh, this is a nice thing for your future, uh, these simulation-based things, 
can be done in Moratuva exactly the same way as we do them in Stuttgart or as they are done in the US. And so uh, this is certainly one thing which is more and more important for the future of many of the people here in, in a university like this. The high, highly expensive measurement devices, this is not the thing which will maybe change in the next few years, uh, but simulations, this is something you absolutely can do and will do. Okay, the last thing for today is about friction steer welding. I'm sure not many of you have heard about friction steer welding. Um, when you press down a certain tool and have it rotating, what happens? There's friction and the friction is creating energy and so the material is heating up. So why not use the same thing by pressing a, a tool down, move it, rotate it all the while, and then if you have two workpieces, they are wel welded together. And this works surprisingly. It's a very nice uh, so-called solid state process uh, <coughs> and there's a complicated material behavior, temperature dependent, of course, and I want to show you here how it looks like. So here is the tool, you press it down. So here are, is one piece to join, here's the other piece. Now you have contact, you rotate this tool, energy is transferred, friction, and in this zone here, material is smeared into each other. And so now when all this is done here, you have a very, very nice, very high quality weld. Um, <coughs> What is the advantage of such a process? Um, it does not need any additional work to do. You can just take it and use the tool, uh, you use the product, and um, you can weld materials which otherwise cannot be weld. Some combinations do not weld because the material is not mixing well. And so this is possible with this kind of friction steer welding processes. It's used a lot in aerospace engineering, for example. They often need very high quality. The cost is not so important for them, but the quality is important. And this can be guaranteed here. Um, but if you want to do this, there are again many things to consider. There is the workpiece with elasticity. There is plastic material, hardening, heat generation, heat conduction, mixing and bonding of materials. Bonding is the thing we are most interested in at the moment. Nonlinear temperature dependent behavior, friction, contact, all these things are available. And a lot of stability problems occur. So here, for example, uh, we wanted to have a, a vibration test. Take this arm here, vibrate it a little bit, and it should work. There is no reason why it should break. The elastic stresses and strains are okay. So this is just for numerical reasons. And so you need to do something. This is not a stable situation. So, and then you have to think what can be done. You have, again, continuity equation, linear momentum equation. And then there are some tricks what you can do. For example, introducing artificial viscosity here. Now, let's check what happened. Uh, much better. Same situation. Now you can do more or less reasonable simulations. But still, it's a little bit annoying and not perfect. So we went back to our desk, thought harder. And then hourglass control was included. Maybe some of you heard about hourglass control. It was also used in finite element simulations. You kind of correct the deformation gradient and do some strange tricks. And if you do it, now you have a perfect simulation, perfectly physical results. So therefore, when you, do, when you see strange effects in your simulations, think what is the background. Is it just a numerical problem? Is it a physical problem? Is it something uh, which was not programmed correctly? And so, so be careful. Okay, so, so, so we solved one of these problems here. Elasticity. <coughs> when you want to simulate uh, with a method like meshless method like SPH elasticity, then you have to verify it. Verification can be done, for example, here with uh, things where you know the solution. For a cylinder which you are rotating torsion, simple mechanics, second semester mechanics, third semester mechanics, then you get analytical solutions and you must make sure that these analytical solutions agree more or less to your computation results. Okay, here's the corresponding relation between stresses and the radius and so it looks more or less okay except here, here it not looks okay at the very boundary of the things and this is very typical for such problems boundary problems 
are everywhere in uh, mesh-free methods. So we have to look into this and check this and improve it. <coughs> but most of these things more or less can be done. I, make, I just check them, so this is more or less fine. And so let's make a first simulation. So here we have the two workpieces, blue and red. There is the rotation. And here you can see the idea. Um, because the temperature is rising up, it's not going to the liquid regime, but before becoming liquid, there's a kind of mushy behavior. And so you smear material into the other. You mix the material, kind of. And so you get here from one work pieces, you, uh, from two work pieces, you get one work piece. So this is the welding process. It looks not too bad, but we are not satisfied because the temperatures were too high. So our temperatures and the temperatures we are able to measure uh, not really fit well together, and so we needed to do something more. And so uh, one important aspect is bonding of material. What is bonding of material? Um, if you press two workpieces very strongly together, then uh, basically there is some interatomic force developing, and so uh, there are bonds, little connections between the two workpieces appearing. You need a lot of force to press them together, but this bonding of two materials is the thing which is missing here. Okay, so here you can see it a little bit. We are rubbing these two workpiece on top of each other. And when we remove them, we can see that there are sometimes, uh, looks like adhesion or so, like if there's glue in between. It's not glue. It's really a mixing of material. Uh, if you want to do this, you must be careful. For example, for aluminum, you have to remove the oxide layer. If there is the oxide layer, you cannot uh, bond this uh, for some other metals. It's easier. And now we have to include this bonding. How to make from one, from separate work pieces, one work piece. And then, of course, we have compared with and without bonding. And so uh, Lisa did a lot of effort, spent a lot of effort. We have to define flow criteria and do many more things. And I'll come in and end in a moment. And this is now uh, one uh, simulation uh, which is really beautiful for us. Um, here we do the same as before. The, you can see also the mixing happens as before. Um, this can be compared with what is really happening. So we are quite close to reality here. And when we investigate now closer where are the bonding, uh, where the bonding happens, we can see it here. Uh, blue means uh, this material is not bonded. Red means bonding occurs. And here you can see the zones where the material is changing and where the, the really the surfaces and the material structures are, con are connected. And so this is now very nice because now we have the real physical effect. So you can do a lot with simulation. I want to show you. And now I want to come to the end. Um, some take home messages. Um, so below you can see uh, one of these um, uh, friction steel welding bonds. Uh, very high quality, quite simple process, uh, a little bit difficult to find the parameters. So it's a complex 3D material flow, and you cannot observe this because everything is in this friction zone, which is hidden, so you cannot make use a camera, for example. Many effects and parameters are influencing this. The bonding is the, the important effect, which you definitely need to consider besides ma plastic material. And then you can do very nice simulations, which are very nicely uh, agreeable, agreeing to reality. Okay, so the basic message um, about mesh-free methods. So you should use particles in mesh-free methods only if you urgently need them. But if you need them, then use these methods and use them in the right way and don't use them too late. So if you see in your simulations that your method is wrong, don't go into the details. Check carefully, think carefully whether maybe the method is the wrong thing to use and then go to another one. So in this sense, I not always recommend mesh-free methods, but they are quite useful. Uh, here you can see some of my co-workers uh, who did uh, this work over the last years. Um, and um, so they did most of the research. I especially like the transition for his hair cut and where he's going with the gender. <laughs> here, two very short hair for him. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. 
Uh, of course, I'm available for questions. Once more, if you want to discuss well with me, come to my office. It's uh, opposite of the uh, head of department's office in mechanical engineering in this uh, area. Uh, or send me an email, uh, and then uh, you can uh, discuss, of course, more. And if you are more interested in other uh, aspects, next week on Thursday, same time, I think same room, I will give two more talks. One will be about music instruments. Uh, the other one will be about optical mechanical uh, simulations and how to couple optics and mechanics. Uh, part of this done was also done by one of the graduates of the um, University of Moratuva in the optics part. And so I will show you two more aspects of dynamics and what you can do there. Thank you very much for being here and for joining me. And please feel free to ask any questions if you have. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 No, 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 this is the true thing. I need to go, let me, um, here you can see it a little bit. Um, in this tool, at the very bottom, there's a small cylinder. This cylinder is pressed into the material and kind of is needed to guide the tool so that it's not going to the side. And so the rotation is around this little cylinder. And uh, if we look careful, I think we can also see it here. Uh, no, here's a little cylinder. Now it's touching here. So now it's pressed into the material, no friction. Now it's uh, the, the big cylinder is on the material and it's rotating and it's moving. Therefore, this small cylinder is part of the tool, and uh, this was also in the simulations, therefore. Uh, th th this cylinder is pressed into the material, and uh, so, so this is a plastic deformation which is happening here, and then this is rotating, and but the big cylinder is here, and the friction is between the big cylinder and the workpiece. And so the combination of the material is when the big cylinder, so this one here, is moved along the workpiece. Um, there are experiments. Uh, but what is the influence? Uh, I don't think that it's really used, uh, th th this motion. So, so um, uh, I, I, I've seen ideas, but I've never seen products where you really can see, okay, this is now a big advantage. Um, in the UK, there is a, a very famous big welding institute, and they have all kinds of welding things, of course, also these modern things. Uh, and, and they have s investigated several things like this. We do this together with the Material Testing Institute of the State. Uh, the size of the tool, uh, one centimeter about here. So um, this size here is about one centimeter in for this thing. Uh, I saw it smaller, so here one centimeter. Uh, I saw it also like five millimeters. I saw it in one and a half, and a half centimeter, but this is about the uh, right thing. Uh, the, it's most widely used in um, aeronautical engineering. A lot of material is welded. Uh, but you can also do strange things, for example, combining aluminum and copper, which cannot be welded otherwise. So you can combine different materials also here. Uh, steel, usually steel. No, 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 I don't think so, because this is symmetric. Um, I, I, I know it's not symmetric, you're right. It's uh, whether you're smearing copper into aluminium or aluminium into copper. Yeah, you're right. For, for dissimilar materials, never saw it. Interesting question, yeah. yeah. For uh, combining aluminium and aluminium as it is done here, it's, it's, it's the same, of course. Yeah. For, for different materials, yeah, it should be a difference, yeah. Right, right. Uh, millimeters, millimeters. So um, one, two millimeters, something like this. So, so, so it, I, I think it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, you, you, it's a lot of particles. So, so um, particle simulations are always time-consuming. So um, for other systems, we have um, simulation times in months. Uh, for these kind of, um, for example, for the laser welding, simulation times are often one or two weeks. But, but yeah, we, 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 have, we have to accept it. So I, I, It's not that bad. Um, so, of course, very often co-workers come to me, uh, we need a new computer. Uh, it ha also always happened. The same happened also t already 25 years ago. Uh, um, and then... Um, <laughs> in the past, these computers have been really expensive. Uh, now it often happens that I tell them, uh, can't we buy a more expensive machine? Um, for example, with more kernels and more memory and so on. Uh, even if you buy a very strong machine, uh, it, it, the range is about 5,000 euro. I do not know how to, comp to compute it to, uh, to, to uh, the local currency. Uh, but it's not that expensive anymore. So with a factor of, let's say, three compared to a usual computer, you can get a very, very fast computer with a lot of memory and very strong CPUs. So for, for us, uh, computation power is not as expensive as it was in the past. And then we have the computation center, which we also can use, but it's not so useful for us as it was in the past. It changed a lot. We have a lot of local things now. Um, th this, this is a good question. What, what, is, the, what is changing over the depth? Um, yeah. um, so uh, when, when we look at the simulation, we can see after this pin was leaving, the material is in this area again. So this is the reason why it's connected. Um, and um, we, um, th the people in th this MPA is the Material Testing Institute of the state of Baden-Württemberg, and we are cooperating with them. Uh, so uh, they uh, did... Um, um, uh, measurements and analyze the results. Um, one way of doing this is uh, cutting this very carefully and polishing the surface and then trying to find out in these polished uh, situations uh, where is which kind of structure. Uh, this is one thing on the ag agenda. I have never seen the results from them. I don't know whether they are already completed or not. Um, but this is something definitely interesting to see the behavior of the depths. So going from so, so is, is there a difference if you look down here or here uh, th th this is of course really important I, it was in our project description included uh, so we have to do it and we have to deliver it but i have not seen any results what, what is happening yeah I'm yeah, yeah. Uh, th th this material testing institute is, is a big institute with something like 400 employees or so and all the facilities. They have all this. Uh, they do a lot of certified testing also, uh, but um, they are not showing us everything uh, they, they, they did. And so I'm not sure what they have done in, in this area. Uh, th they have all the, all the X-ray machines and all these 3D scanners available. Uh, it's always a question how to get access to this and what to do. Um, but, but the analysis can be done and they are interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for, for this institution, it's uh, usually more a question of uh, getting access to these things. Um, they, uh, they have everything available. In the past, they tested the nuclear power plants of Germany. Uh, so there are also many weld seams, and they have been checked, every single one of them. Uh, so all the, um, the things are available, uh, but when they have industry contracts, they always have priority over the academic contracts. 
and so uh, they cannot always do as they want, our direct partners. But I'm sure they, that they are able to do it and have all the equipment. Yeah, yeah, they are commercially used. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mainly in uh, aeronautical engineering, there, there, it's very useful. Uh -huh. No, this is um, I I it's an established uh, technique, uh, but it's only used if you really need it. Mm -hmm. For example, the thickness is nearly not changing. If you do uh, with electro uh, welding or gas welding, the thicknesses can change and you have additional material included there which maybe can uh, lead to cracks and this kind of things. And that's why people in aeronautical are so, so happy about these kind of things. Uh, and in other areas, uh, the preparation of the completed thing is important. Uh, so, so the cleaning and the polishing and, and th here this needs only very little polishing, which is also an advantage of laser welding, which also needs very little polishing and uh, reworking. These are the main parameters, yeah. 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 And uh, the, the, the speed uh, the tool is moving, this is another important parameter. Mm -hmm. No, 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 because um, uh, aluminium is a nasty material because it has a very hard oxide layer and very often you have to remove this oxide layer before you can do some processing. And because of the strong friction, this oxide layer is basically um, <laughs> just wiped out and then uh, therefore it does not need special preparation. All, all this is investigated extensively, yes. Um, so, for example, in many uh, weld procedures, uh, there are, can cracks happen uh, where the weld and the original material comes together. And uh, so this is something which is uh, one property which is quite nice here. Or also pore, pores, uh, so basically empty spaces can happen. Uh, this is also not a problem here, which is a problem in laser welding. Uh, and even a worse problem in gas welding, of course. Um, so so um, all this is quite investigated in detail, but I'm not an expert in this uh, field, not, not at all. I, I, I just know what they told me, what they showed me, uh, but uh, I've never done any, or we have, our, my institute has never done any experiments ourselves. So the experimental things are done completely in the Material Testing Institute. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Th this is a nice thing in continuous simulations like finite elements. Rupturing is very very difficult to describe, but the continuous behavior is simple to describe. And in these meshless methods, it's often vice versa. The continuous behavior is difficult to describe, but uh, rupturing and free surface and this kind of thing is easy to do. So uh, the methods are very complementary to each other. Recording stopped. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention and maybe we see each other again next week. <laughs> Bye. Recording in progress.